Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the Bill of Materials training. In this week, I'm going to show you how you can build your very own Bill of Materials complete with inventory items and we're going to be able to assemble those with just a few clicks or disassemble and we're going to also be able to expand and show all the parts within that BOM. It's going to be an incredible training. I cannot wait to share everything with you. So let's get started. All right, thanks so much for joining me this week. This was a highly requested training, so I'm really happy to be able to get it to you, and I'm gonna walk you through every step. But first, what is a bill of materials and why do we need it? Well, a bill of materials, also known as BOM, is a basically a list or a compilation of materials and sometimes labor that make up a single component. So for example, in our sample here, we've got a computer set and this computer setup made up of different parts, including a motherboard, graphics, computer. So it's made up of all different kinds of parts. If you're a computer store, you're gonna buy all these parts individually. You may build them together and sell the computer as a single unit. So what you want to do, it's very important, you want to know how many computers you need to build and it all depends on how many components you have. Now that assembly is the list of basically all the components that you need. So you have an item list and then you, what you want to do is you add so many items. For example, this computer con contains one motherboard, a computer fan, a graphics card and so on and so forth. And it also has two DDR RAM so you can put how many are required. And what you want to do, if you've got all your inventory items, you want to be able to build them build those and so what you want to do is if you know based on a certain limit you've got 10 available to build so you can build let's say five of those and now you have five that are available to be sold in this so when you go to general info we're going to see that we now have 10 available we just added we had five before now we've got 10 available so the idea is to take your materials your raw materials and make up a complete component or a complete product and it can also include labor and that you can then sell that part so you can combine it you have a combined cost and then you have a combined it can be very very complex but we're going to break it down super simple and i'm going to show you how you need this this type bill of materials is used in almost every type of industry that kind of sells whether it's manufacturing whether it's hardware whether we're looking at different types of sales or, or inventory you use these and you combine these in fact you can even use these in construction my former industry for example if we have let's say we have a bathroom vanity set right so this is a set you've got a faucet you've got supply lines and you want to create that assembly so that you can sell that to your customers so you would take a bathroom vanity uh, some silicon caulk a countertop a faucet and combine and even some labor and labor and then combine all of that into a single unit that you can sell and so you can see all the components here so what we're going to do is we're going to use excel and we're going to break it down into some really easy to understand items and also we've got a really really cool general info so when we like individual parts we see we have individual parts of these so each one of these is a faucet and then what we want to do is we want an assembly or make that up so that's what we're going to go over today and i'm going to show you how to do this you can put this in any type of application so i'm going to walk you step by step through the entire process all right so let's get started but before we do that i just want to remind you of a few things this training is absolutely free. I bring these to you each and every Tuesday. I just ask a few things. If you could please subscribe to our channel, that would really help. Go ahead and click that subscription and don't forget the notification icon bell. That's gonna get you alerted each and every week that I bring these to you. These are of course absolutely free. You can download this workbook also for free in the links down below. I'm creating these free, but I do create a lot more than just this in our Patreon account. For example, this week, I've got an incredible uh, bill of materials, but I may add on things like invoicing and purchasing onto this, and that's available in our Patreon account. So we take your suggestions, your ideas, and I add to each application every week, and that includes an update application, and it also includes an updated training, whether it's you know anywhere from 10 to 30 or 40 minutes or whatever it is, based on your suggestions, ideas. All of that is available in Patreon. The link is down below, Excel for Freelancers. You can find us on Patreon, and that's gonna really help us out. If just a few dollars a month, 
it'll get you a ton more value so i really appreciate you supporting us on patreon all right so let's get started on this training we'll go over the foundation how i created it every component every function every feature every formula every conditional formatting that we're using and how it all done and every of course line of code so we're going to get into that right now so the basic idea is just a pretty basic form that we have for our materials now these can be any type of material notice that we also have an item name here we've got an item type now if we select a, just a basic component let's just say silicone caulking white this is an item type and notice how the tab the assembly tab is gone right this is not an assembly part however if we click on an assembly now an assembly is also known as a kit it's also known as a group also known as a bill of materials so it really depends on how you want to call it but there's many names for it but basically it is simply a collection of items and possibly labor that go into a single part that you can all buy and sometimes sell as well so however when we do have a assembly like as in this full computer we see that this is an assembly type right so we have different item a service type an assembly type we've got different types based on that and an assembly has this tab available so when we click on this tab here we see that we can then add additional information so if, let's say we don't need this and we don't need this so we've got some additional information here so this assembly items we can then have a list of our items these are all of our items and then we can add to that list and we can say here's the item description how many are required to build it for example if we were building a computer we may have two pieces of ram or for example if we are building let's say something that i'm more familiar with here inside the bathroom let's say if you're into construction field let's pull up that assembly we've got a bathroom kit in which is this bathroom vanity set now this bathroom vanity set is made up of several items you know and then it's also made up we need two supply lines for hot and cold water we need a valve for hot and cold water so each one of these contains a kit and it's also going to attain some labor probably not one hour probably maybe more like five hours of labor so we can update that we just click update and it's going to update that it's going to take that total assembly cost now this is all of the item costs that have now where do those item costs come from well that comes from our item database let's take a look inside this item database and see what it's get, also known as an item list we've got an item id this is unique for every item i've got an item name we've got the type that we just went over remember we've got some service some are item and some are assemblies here we've got even a bathtub if we want to work on that we've got a part number a unit of measure also known as uom the category which is just something that we can assign purchase description a sales description which would come in handy You'd, on a sales description when you're selling it would be on the invoice on a purchase description this would be on a purchase order uh, what is the normal purchase quantity when you purchase this what is that quantity that you're purchasing is it one two three four this is not a this is not a you know so how many are you purchasing and how many are you selling normally right also we want to know the item cost what is the item cost and how do we know it so we've got item cost and we've got a sales price this is what's going to go on the individual both in the item parts also known when you invoice it's also going to go on the invoice i also want to know what the quantity in stock how many do i have in stock right so when we go ahead and build that bath and vanity set now we have two in stock right so here we have two in stock but what if we want to build more we can build more and i'll show you how we're gonna do that in just a moment also we have a picture associated with this and we have some notes so that's all that's made up of this item list and that is all translated into here so we have the part and serial number purchase description here purchase quant default purchase this should be general here so we've got the purchase quantity here this default sales quantity and the item cost and this so this particular this vanity cost right we have based on all of the parts in stock if we take a look at this we've got a cast iron bathtub right so we cannot build anything but if i remove that we don't use this generally so let's say we remove a few items because we were always just putting them out as a sample so let's take a look at this to create this bathroom vanity kit i need a cabinet i need some silicone i need a countertop i need a single handle faucet i need labor i need a ceramic sink i need two supplies 
Y lines and I need two elbows. So I need all that to create this, right? So here's my quantity in stock. If I have all that, but I don't have any, this is service rate, so that wouldn't matter. But if I don't have, if I've got 46 available, how many can I create? Well, I would say I can create up to six. Why is that? Because I only have six tubes of silicone caulking. If I were to change that in half, you know, we only use a half a tube, I can create a lot more. But let's just stick with that for now. One, so that means that six, we can create six of those. And that's just what I have here, available to build six, right? If I try to assemble seven of those, it's gonna tell us, no, we cannot assemble more than we have, right? I can't create that assembly. I can do it a maximum of six, right? So I can create six. And what that's going to do is it's gonna, when I click that, it's automatically going to deduct the inventory. Now we have no more caulking because we've combined that all into a single kit. We can now sell it. We've put it all together and we've made it available for sale. So now we have nothing available to build and we've assembled a total of eight. We now have eight of these bathroom cabinets to stick. And of course, these bathroom cabinets here, they contain a single cabinet, some silicone caulking, a countertop, a faucet, five hours of labor, one sink, two supply lines, and two valves. So this is combined and we have in stock on hand eight. Now let's say we decide we want to disassemble. We want to take those apart essentially and be able to sell them individually. We can do just that. Now we have total assembled of eight. If we set 10 to disassemble, well, that's not going to work because obviously we only have eight. But if we want to, let's say we want to disassemble six, we can do just that. And what that's going to do is it's going to disassemble those parts. It's going to deduct from the inventory. Now we only have two available, but we also have available now more silicone caulking. So we can assemble and disassemble these, um, let's say assemblies or build of materials or BOMs or however you want to say it back and forth. And that's really, really important in manufacturing and the industries where we can work with these um, raw materials to create products that we can sell. So we've got all that so we can be able to disassemble. I'm going to walk you through every step. Once we update that product, everything gets saved. Okay. So here in the general information, we have basically notes. So how are we going to do all this? Well, let me walk you step by step through this application. We'll get into the admin, which is just very basic. I've got a picture folder. Now, this is the folder that all of our parts are located, and that looks just like here. Again, we've got our computer and bathroom parts, two very different industries, but I wanted to show you two very different samples of how something like this can be used. So we've got a bunch of pictures here, and that's essentially it. I've got some item types here, categories, which are whatever you want to put in, and some units of measure, which is just kind of informational. That's pretty much it, basically. Items and item data we've been over. Now, assemblies is everything that we've got. We've got an assembly ID. Remember that bathroom kit, that bathroom? That is called the assembly item 9. What does that 9 come from? It is this inside the item database. That bathroom vanity set is item ID 9. It is an assembly right? We're selling them as each. And we have uh, in stock, we have two in stock right now. And so the best way to do that is to simply track them in assembly. So once we load that assembly item in there, I need to make sure we load all of these items that are associated with and their associated quantities, the requested quantity. We have five hours of labor to supply. So that means when I load that item in here, I load that item, all I need to do is just change it here loading that one in here let's say the bath and vanity set is already loaded in we want all those items to load here's those items right so again this is item number nine and i'll show you that in a minute this item id nine it's not displayed here but it is displayed here in the first column located in b3 so we have that so we know that those are individually tracked likewise of course inside our computer kit here our full computer set that we have all those associated items here again two rams and one of everything else that's going to get again we have 10 in stock here so we have available to build five why do we have five available to build why is that because look we only have a total of 10 pieces of ram if each kit uses two pieces we only can build five that's why we have the five so it's really really important to keep track of all this stuff and again just like here that's item number 21 and here's all the items that we are so they're all stored in this assembly database and all i need to know is the quantity required i need to know the item row what is this item row we're going to get into that in vb but basically it's the row that's associated here 36 through 45 those are the rows so when we bring it back into that we know what row to place it on 36 to 45 which 
just correctly right here 36 to 45 those are the rows i also want to know the database row that's this row the 14 right all the way through 23 that's the database row when i bring this information back in here inside the items if i decide to make a change here i want to make sure i know what row inside the database to update right so that in this step if i make that update i know that this changed to two if i change it back to one click update i need to make sure i know what row to update that's row 23 so that row 23 must come in somewhere and it must be placed somewhere but it can be placed off the screen in our case we've placed it over here so we know that that row 23 is right here so the assembly database row is stored here i'll go through the other things very shortly so keep that in mind that's what we want to do so we've got the assembly now i've got some empty sheets for invoice purchase order invoice database what i'm going to be doing is i'm going to be adding an invoice i'm going to be adding a purchase order but that's going to be for exclusively for our patreon customers so it'd be great to have you in patreon right you're going to we're going to show you how to take all this and put it in an invoice how to put it inside a purchase order and then how to track inventory accordingly for that so make sure you get on patreon all right so let's get into it so how do we do all this so we've got to basically run down that's all the sheets it's relatively simple because our databases simply contain an item database here and an assembly database that's it that's all we have so it's very simple but what we want to do is we want to to basically be able to differentiate when we're loading those items in between an assembly item and we want to differentiate between a regular item because there's some changes that are made notice there's no plus sign here there's no tab here so we can through vba and conditional formatting we're going to show you that however when we load a bom a build materials we do want that plus we do want to expand on that and i want to be able to show all the items within that so that's it we're going to really use this really cool to vba i'm going to walk you through that okay so the first thing is notice we've got some conditional formatting formatting and that conditional formatting is going to make this here this tab assembly item show or hide based on what is located right here in h5 and that means if h5 here i want this to show up if it's an assembly if it's anything else then i don't want it to show up for example this hourly labor is a service their service is not part of any so we don't want to make it if we were to change it we would it would then show up so how do we change that how do we get that that's through conditional formatting so let's take a look at that inside the home go into the conditional formatting and then manage rules and i've got just a few rules to show you okay so the first thing what i want to do is i want to track what column the user or has selected this in this case is column number four this and let's go back to our kit so we can select both of them because nothing will happen nothing will, which is what i want nothing's going to happen here only if it is an assembly item so on our computer here that would be an assembly item then so basically i want to either it's we select column four which is column d or we select column six and i want to place that column through vba and i want to put it directly inside b1 so B1 is going to tell us this is going to be four, this is going to be six. Notice how B1 changed, right? So we're going to do conditional formatting based on the value of located what's in B1. So back into conditional formatting and we manage rules and we take a look at this. And we're going to edit this rule. When B1 equals six, that would be the assembly tab. Then what do I want to do? I want to format it. I want to give it a special format and I'm going to give it this fill effects. And when we look in the fill effects, we see it's a darker, a little bit lighter blue to a very light blue. So it's that reverse. And I want to make sure when we have that tab effect that this second color, this light blue, is exactly the same as the main background color so that it blends in. And also what I want to do is two other things. I want to make sure that the font is set to bold and I want to make sure that that lower border is missing. And that's how we get that blended effect for the tab. So that way, when we click assemblies, you see that lower border is missing. It's in bold font and we've given it that lighter look, right? So if we take a look in the formatting and we go into home and we look in the formatting, actually let's format those cells. If we take a look inside the format, they both have the same format. They both have a fill effects of basically the reverse. Notice it's the same colors here same colors but this one is this simply this light to dark light to dark right so what did we do is we simply reverse that when they select okay so we gives it that reverse notice it starts out light and then it goes to dark but here it starts out dark and goes to light and missing the border so 
both of them have that same format is the conditional formatting so when this becomes one we're going to apply that conditional formatting for four so well, let's go ahead and highlight and back into that conditional formatting again and then manage those rules so when it's six but when it's four we're going to do exactly the same thing the only difference is with this one is we're going to apply it to d3 through e3 and why is that because we're using a combined cell right this is the merged cell here between d3 and e3 so we need to apply it to both of them and then also one more, we have a, a conditional formatting. If we edit this rule, we see that H5, it does not equal assembly. When it does not equal assembly, I want to hide it completely. F3, I want to hide it. Here's F3. I don't want to show it if it's not assembly, if it's a service or item or anything else. I simply want to hide this tab. So when we edit that rule in format, we see a few things. We see it's got the fill. We take a look at the font. The font is simply hidden. We're coloring the font as the same as the background color. We take a look at the border here. We also see that the border is missing on the top and the right. We don't want it to show. So that way, those three different rules allow us this tab feature. Right? So when we make a selection, it is VBA, when we make a selection change, that applies that and does all the rest of the work for us. So that's what we're going to go in now. We're going to show you this tab feature. So I, we understand that the conditional formatting, two rules based on the tab you selected and based on the item type. So when we select a different item, that tab is going to be completely gone. When we go into VBA, when we make a selection on this, this selection, nothing's going to happen if this is not assembly, right? When we make a selection, nothing will happen. So we've told VBA, hey, if this is not assembly, when the user selects F3, nothing happens, right? So that's what we want. We only want to switch that tab when it is actually an assembly type item. Right? So then and only then do we want that to fill. Great, so let's get into VBA. Take a look at that selection change that we're going to have so we get that tab effect. Now, to do that, all we've done, we're keeping certain rows consistent. We're going to keep this row four. If we see rows one through three are kept consistent, but what we're going to do is we're going to hide rows. So if we unhide these rows and we see what it looks like, I'm just clicking unhide. I know it's off the screen. So I'm unhiding those rows. So basically all we have is a section of rows for our first main, our general info, and then we have our assembly info right here. So all it is is two simple tabs. And then I've got a list of item names. This is going to help us for autocomplete. So that way when I put in a computer, let's put in, put in, it's going to automatically complete, right? So I'll show you that in just a moment. But uh, basically that's what this list is doing right here. Okay, so we understand that. So we understand that we're simply just hiding and showing rows based on whatever tab. So when we select general info, we want to hide rows 32 through 60. When we want to click assembly, we want to again show rows 33 through 50 or 60. So that's all we're going to do. And that's what we're going to do inside VBA. So let's get inside VBA and take a look at that and show you exactly how we've done that. That'll be in the developers tab. If you don't have the developers tab or you don't see it here, all you need to do is just click on the file, depending upon what version of Excel you're using, properties, and then customize the ribbon. Just make sure you've got the developers selected. You can also get in using Alt F11. That's a shortcut to get you inside VBA. And we're going to focus on the selection change. So inside, I've got several sheets here, but we're going to focus primarily on the items sheet. That's the one marked items here. So, and we're focused on selection change. If you want to know how to get to that worksheet and then you select selection change from here and that's going to show up. And that's going to show up all the selection change. So all the events that we're focused on at this moment are based on selection change. When the user makes a change to the selection of a cell. So this first line of code, if target count large is greater than two, then exit the sub. This helps prevents a lot of errors. When users make a change to selection change to a lot of cells, we don't want anything to happen. We want to make sure that we're exiting out of the sub. So that's exactly what we do and it prevents errors. All right, continuing on, if the user makes a selection change in either anywhere from D3 through F3 and H, value h5 equals assembly right remember we only want this trigger when it's assembly if they make a change on anything here we only want anything to happen when it's assembly right there's no tab feature when it's an item so only when h5 equals assembly then we're going to continue first thing what i want to do is inside b1 i'm going to place that target column target column inside b1 okay so I want to first thing I want to hide everything. I'm going to turn off screen updating. This allows us to make it a lot faster and get less flashing. So the first thing I want to do after that is I want to hide a picture button group. What is the pick button group? Well, that is this thing right here. I want to hide the picture button group right here. 
This button group here is a set of pictures that allows us to add and hide pictures. It's called the picture button group. It's a set of shapes. So I want to hide that. So we don't need that, right? If we're sweet, I want to hide it. Regardless of the tab, the first thing I want to do is I want to hide it because we don't know what they're going to do. So we either show it or we'll show it. And then also what I want to do is the assembly group. This assembly group here is located right here inside here inside the assembly we have two different tabs right here these two different buttons we're calling the assembly group it allows us to assemble or disassemble our products and that's called the assembly group so we want to hide those features regardless and then what we're going to do is simply show them based on the tab that was selected continuing down in the macro okay so once those are hide i want in case there's an item picture there may or may not be an item picture if there is we're going to always give it that name called item picture i want to make sure that this picture regardless of what it is is going to give it a name item picture and we're going to hide that again regardless of that that way you know generally when they're switching tabs i want to hide it and then we'll show it just in case they're on the right tab so also what i want to do is i want to hide all of the rows hiding all of them four through 60 hiding everything then everything else is based on what what tab was selected if the tab column equals four remember that four that's column d then it's the general info else down here it's the assembly so we're going to do a few things if they've selected the general info the first thing what i want to do is i want to unhide those rows remember four through 31 entire row hidden equals false i want to display all those rows i also want to display the picture button group that's that group that we hit up here i want to make sure that that's displayed and then i want to show a picture but only if it exists that item picture also, I want to know if H5 equals assembly, then I want to know the expand button. Remember, we saw some things on the expand. Remember this thing we've given that called expand button. I want to show that plus, but I only want to show that plus. Obviously, if it's assembly, I want to make sure, just to make sure, although we have to be in assembly almost always, but I want to make sure that we only show this when it's assembly. So if it's assembly, then we're going to show that. And then what I want to do is I want to select something else. Anytime we use selection change, especially for that, like this, I don't want to keep my selection directly on E3. I want it to go somewhere else. So it's going to go directly to F5. Same thing here. When we're on assembly, I want to change that selection. I want to go to E36. So we're changing it based on that. Uh, so I just want to make sure we, we select something like a tab feature, we want to select another cell. So that's just what we've done inside here. So that's all we need to do if it's general info. Next up, just a few lines of code if it is an assembly. If it is, then in the rows 33 through 60, entire row hidden equals false. In other words, we're displaying all those rows. The assembly group, those two pictures that disassemble and assemble those two pictures, that's grouped together. We're going to show that. We're going to display that. Again, E36, we're going to select that cell. Also, I want to double check just again, make sure that if the, it's assembly, it should always be, but just in case, I want to show the shrink button. I want if the shape shrink button visible equals true. If it if any of those buttons, the show or hide, I just want to make sure that they're hidden. So if that shrink button, what is that shrink button here? That is this button right here. This one right here, this little minus here is called shrink button button right if you like these icons and these pictures and all these shapes i've got all those in a folder available to you on the resources inside patreon i've packaged everything together in a nice zip file so you can recreate this when you get into patreon okay so that's what this is called here so that's called shrink but i want to make sure that this is not shown when i select here i want to make sure that that's also hidden so that's all we do just to make sure okay so also i want the expand button we're going to hide that as well okay so that's all and then we're going to turn application screen up Day on so that is it that's all we have to do to get that really really great tab feature working for us so it's very very easy on that okay so what else in this screen i want to show you well first of all we need to be able to add a picture very easily and that's relatively simple if we want to add a picture we can add any picture just select it here and it's going to place directly in here we can also clear a picture if i want to clear a picture i can do that and we can just simply add the picture back up here right here this bath and vanity clicking okay it's going to add that picture right back into it so so we want to make sure to be able to save it and then clicking update is going to save any changes that we made. Okay, we can also delete the item, add a new, but let's go into the macros that add this picture and clear the picture. They're relatively simple. So all we have to do is go into the item macros right here. We're going to start out and then we've got some, uh, basically some dimensions and variables we're going to go over. I want to know the item row, right? This is going to be the row of which we're going on, right? We're going to loop through the items. I want to know the item column. That's going to be really, really important because once we save this information, we're going to use data mapping. I've got a dedicated video on that, but basically 
basically it is here. Again, I've gone over this several times if you haven't seen my videos, but basically F5, if we look at F5, this is data mapping. And basically it maps the item name H5 to the counterpart here. So notice this is F5, this is our item name. And it comes in this column here, item name is F5, our type is H5. So it allows us to quickly bring all this data inside our database or it automatically quickly allows us to take this database information and bring it directly inside here. Remember, I do have dedicated videos, check uh, our easy uh, form we've got a few different forms so we've got lots of videos on that so i hope that helps all right continuing on so we've got data mapping here so we need to use the column we're going to be looping through these columns column one two all the way to the last column what's that last column we need to know column because that's going to be helpful it's going to be column 15 so we're going to loop through column 15 okay so we need to know that column inside a variable that's why we have it here i need to know the last row of the database i need to know the last result row now this is going to come in handy when we run our advanced filter the last assembly row remember we've also got assembly row so i'm going to need to know the last row of that if we need to add them or we need to run advanced filter we need to know maybe we only want to know assemblies for nine so we're going to put that into an advanced filter and get those results and then bring those results in so we're going to need to know that so we also have the assembly database row for focus on a specific row and the assembly row i also want to know the item id a picture file and the picture folder remember that picture folder is located directly inside our admin here so we're located in c4 so we need to put that inside a variable as well Okay, also what I want is I want to know the full picture path. That picture path is basically going to be combined. That picture folder located inside our admin here along with the actual picture name. So the combination of the name of the picture with the folder is going to be our full file path. When we combine those, we get an accurate path. So we're going to need that and also the picture path and the result row as long. Okay. We, all, we need that for our picture, we're going to need an item file picture as a file dialog and an item shape as a shape. We'll be going over this. So to add an item picture, again, we're going to put that item picture folder, that string variable, based on C4, whatever folder is in C4. Then what I want to do is I want to make sure that that has a proper directory. If it's not, please add a picture file path inside the admin screen. Just in case there's an issue, directory item picture folder vb directory if that's empty there's an issue so we did exit the sub okay assuming that there is a value we can right we can't add a picture if we don't know where to put that picture so we need to have an accurate folder that folder all you need to do when you get this file if you don't know you can just simply browse for that whatever the folder that is like in this case browse it all we would need to do is just copy this here whatever the picture folder is if you've gotten the pictures here and you would just need to paste it inside admin here and just paste it directly in the cell that's easier you can also add a browser browse button to put that folder in here we've done that in the past the browse button works just fine as well but okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the items and we're going to have that set the item file picture that's the one that's been as a file dialog set that it can be the application file dialog and we're looking for a file we don't want to pick a folder we want to pick a specific file so this is going to be called the mso file dialog file picker right we want to pick a specific file and what i want to do is with that item picture i want to give it a please select an item picture and then i want to give it several types what type of picture files we're going to allow the user png jpg gif there's a lot more you can add to this if you want to give the user the ability to add different like gifs and and other or jpeg or something like that or bmps there's a lot more that you can add to this if necessary for our purposes today that is sufficient allow multi-select no we just want them to select a single picture if for some reason they click the cancel button they don't go out we need to make sure that they've selected something if not if they select something the dot show is going to be negative one so if they don't select anything it's going to be does not equal negative one then we're going to go to no selection it's going to drop them down here and just exit out okay but assuming that they have picked something what i want to do is i want to take that full file path of wherever it's located on their computer wherever it's located i need to copy that into our folder right because it may not be already in this folder maybe somewhere else on their computer what we want to do is we want to make sure we have a known location for that picture to do that we're going to copy it from wherever they've browsed for it and we're going to paste it directly into their folder so we know where to find that picture once again so the first thing we want to do is get the full file path 
of its existing location. Once we have that in a variable, we're good to go. We can move on. Then what I want to do is I want to take the name of that file, just the name. I don't want to put it somewhere else. Where do I want to put it? I'm going to put it right here located in L. If we take a look at this and we see it's kind of in a, in a darker font. Let me change that font a little bit to blue. Bathroom assembly. We're going to put the name of that file directly in L6. I don't want the full picture path. What I want is just the name. So to extract that name, we're going to use the directory function. And we can do that with here. So l6.values equal the directory of the picture path. What that's going to do is extract the file name from the file path. And it's going to put it directly there in L6. Why is that important? Because when I save that file, whatever's located in L6, when I update that, whatever's located in L6 is going to come directly over to the data and save it directly. Notice the L6 here inside column N. It's going to save it right here. So that's very, very important. Once we do, then I've saved the name, but now what I need to do is I need to copy that picture into our folder that's dedicated for those pictures. To do that, we're going to use the file copy function. We're going to take its original location and then its destination. That original location is the picture path. The destination is our picture folder plus the backslash plus the name of the file, just the name of the file. We're going to copy the picture, this single line of code. In case it's already there, I've added on air resume next and on air go to zero. If it's already there, it would create an issue. So we just did that. Theoretically, what you could do is you could also use the kill function. You could kill anything there, and that would do that kill function. This would delete whatever's there and then replace it in case the picture is different. The last thing I want to do is simply run the macro to show that picture. That is the next macro that we're going to go over. So We've separated that into two different macros because there are instances when we do want to show this picture, like when we're loading a specific item that we want to show it. So we have this in a separate macro. And it's this macro right here called item show picture. Again, what I want to do is I want to delete any picture that might exist. When I show that picture, any picture that might exist, we're always going to give it the same name regardless. It's called item picture. So the first thing we're going to do is just going to delete that. In case it doesn't exist, it would present an error. So we want to make sure that we wrap that in on air resume next and on air go to zero. That's going to delete any picture there. What I want to do is if L6, L6 is our picture name, that's very important. If it's empty, there's nothing we can do. So we can exit the sub out. Assuming that L6 does contain a value, we can then wrap that in our picture path variable. It's going to be admin wherever that folder is located again with that backslash and l6 this is our full picture path full picture path i do want to run a check to make sure that it is, it is an accurate path and to do that again we're going to use the directory function the directory of the picture path in vb directory if it equals empty and then we're going to let the user know the picture name or folder is incorrect please let the user know exit the sub we can't display a picture that doesn't exist so we can exit out of there assuming it does exist then we can insert that picture using the dot pictures dot insert what are we inserting we're inserting that picture path we're giving it a name. Remember, we want to give it that very specific name each and every time. Once we know the name, always, we can then work with it. We can delete it. We can move it. We can size it around. We can hide it. We can do many things with it, but we have to know the name. So we give it a very specific name. Once we've given a name, we can then work with it. So with dot shapes item picture, first thing we're going to do is we're going to lock that aspect ratio. I want to do that to make sure that it doesn't get contorted. So that's the first thing I want to do. I want to maintain. If it's a horizontal picture, I want to maintain it. If it's a vertical picture, I want to maintain it. Then what I want to do is I want to center it directly based on the size. I want to center it directly here between columns L and M, between rows 7 through 14. I want to center it. So how do we do that? Well, we've been over this before, if you know. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the width of columns L through M. Then I'm going to take the width of this picture. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract the width of this column minus the width of this picture. We're going to get, let's say, a certain value. Then what I want to do is I want to split that width. I want to divide it by two. And I want to put it based on this. So whatever the left position of this L, I want to add that width to it. And then we're going to do the same thing for the height. Again, I'm going to determine the height of rows 7 through 14. I'm going to determine the height of this picture. I'm going to make a subtraction and divide by two. Then I'm going to add that, whatever the difference is, I'm going to add that directly to the top position of L7. So that's just what we've done here directly. First, we need to determine which is bigger, the width or the height, and we need to set the height. If the width is greater than the height, 
then the width is equal to 90, else the height is equal to 90. So we're just setting limits on the height and width. And it's already been. Okay, so now all we're doing is setting the left position. Again, the left position is equal to the left position, the starting left position, wherever that L7 is, that left position. And then, again, we're going to take the width of that column. Remember, L3M, the width of that. I'm going to subtract out the width of the specific picture. Subtract, and then we're going to divide that by 2. So that division we're adding to the left. Once we do that, it's automatically centered based on the left position. We can do the same thing for the top, but slightly different. In this case, I'm going to take the top position of L7. Remember, just what I said, the top position of L7. We're going to add something to that. What are we going to add to that? Well, again, I'm going to take the height this time of rows 7 through 14, and I'm going to subtract out the height of the picture. I'm going to divide that by 2, and I'm simply adding that to the top. Left position or center, top position. Put this in here, centered, left position, and then we have the centered, top position, centered, top position position. Okay, so that's how we get it. And then make, last thing, I just want to make sure that it's true. It should automatically be visible. When we insert it, it should be visible, but just to ensure, we're going to make sure that that picture is visible. That is all we have to do to make sure that we're showing that picture and centering it in those cells. I did have a question on that, so I'm happy to answer that. Okay, clear item picture is very simple. That's the macro that's tied to the clear button. Again, we're going to simply delete that picture. We don't need to hide it. We're simply going to delete it. And then I want to clear the contents of whatever's in L6, clearing that picture and then making sure that assuming the user updates that it'll save or update it great so that's it so we also have an add new feature we'll go over this add new is basically going to clear out everything else and gives us the ability to add new we load it in seven. so the best way to do add new is set a specific data fields i want to set a named range for all the fields that have to be cleared out i've done that already and basically we just select all the fields using control and then we give it a named range i've done that already so if we look into the formulas name manager and we see item data right here item data and we tab over it and i'm going to move this over and we see that all the selected cells including the merge cells are automatically selected you see that including that so that's how we do that so make sure if you're going to select on it make sure that you go in and edit this named range because especially when it's coming to merge cells they won't automatically get so in other words if i select it only the upper left cell is going to be included so you need to go back in here and you need to actually update that so we would say items g8 here you need to add colon through h9 you need to make sure that the full cell when we try to if we try to clear out only g8 and it is a merged cell it's going to create an error so you need to make sure it's going to say that it has all of the cells g8 through h9 in this case here g8 through h9 we want to make sure to include all the cells okay so we've created that and then of course we've given that the name it's called item data so when i select item data we see everything is selected here so it is that that we're going to clear out so now that we have all that in the named range we can easily clear out all the data using a single line of code so we're going to focus on the items um, the first thing what I want to do is I want to delete any shapes that is there. So any shapes, what shapes might that be? Well, I mean, it might be the item thing. So notice if we've got, um, let's say we've selected an assembly here, here, and uh, let's take this one here. So we've got some shapes. So take a look at these shapes. Now, each one of these shapes has a, the, they start with assembly pictures. So if the user clicks add new, I want to make sure to clear out all these pictures, right? We need to clear out all those pictures. So the first thing we want to do is run a loop through all the shapes in a sheet. And I'm looking for only specific shapes to delete. Obviously, I don't want to delete my buttons. I don't want to delete my icon. I only want to do certain ones. So which ones do I want to do? I only want to focus on shapes that contain a certain amount of text. And that text is going to be called assembly pick 41 or assembly pick notice even our text boxes have the same name it's called assembly pick text so anything that contains the word assembly pick i want to make sure we delete that so we can do that with a few lines of code so for each item in shape using the in string function the item shape dot name if it contains assembly pick and that means it's greater than zero it is found what are we going to do we're going to delete that and we're just going to loop through every single shape in the sheet so make sure if you're using this make sure that assembly pick is only unique to the ones that you do want to delete okay so what after that we remember we've got our named range that we went over that item data that data that's all the data we're going to clear the contents of all the data in those cells also i want to make sure that we have that expand that plus 
button. We have the shrink button, that minus icon. I want to make sure that those are hidden. I want to clear the contents of B3. B3, what is located in B3? B3 is located our item, our selected item ID. So we want to clear that out because it's a new one. So when we add new, I want to make sure that B3. So we also have an item row. If I've selected an item, I want to make sure that we have set an item. We know that this item, we're going to use an item ID. We've got some named ranges called item ID. So what is the item ID? That is a dynamic named range based on the item ID here. So if we go into the formulas and name manager and item ID, this is using the offset. We've been over there a few times if you've seen my videos. And basically as this grows, so does this grow. So what I want to do is I want to find the row that's located on that specific. I want to know that 9 is located in row 12 or something like that. So basically when we select something, I need to know that. So how are we going to know that? Well, in this case, I want to make sure that we use the match function. So we're going to match whatever's in B3, in this case it's item ID 9, using the item ID, and we want 0, we want an exact match. We're going to be adding 3. Why is that? Because our first one starts on row 4, so we need to add, we're looking for the row number. So we need to add 3 to do that. The next ID is going to use the max item, that's going to help us. Maxing that plus 1, if our, if our last one is 21, our next one's going to be 22 using the max function, because I need to know if it's a brand new one, we need to assign that next ID, and I'm going to put that to the next item. So very important that we have that next one available to us. And when item load is false, we may be using that. Okay, so that's it for that. Then I'll, I will get into these two sample shapes. These help us create our map data. So clearing the contents, new item group. I want to show that group. That's a two set of button. This is called this is called existing item group. Take a look at that. These are three buttons: the add new, the update, and the delete. And we also have another button set called the new item group. And those are the two buttons: save item and cancel new. So for new items, I want to show this group. And for existing items, I want to show this group existing items. So we can do that. The new item group we want visible, and the existing item we want. That's it. And then also, what I want to do is I want to run a macro called cl item clear picture. Right? That's that. That's that macro that we went over here. So I want to clear any picture that might have gone there. That's it. That's all we need to do for add new. Save and update. We'll go over this. Basically what I want to do is I want to make sure that F5 contains a value. F5, of course, is our bathroom name. They cannot save it. If they try to save something that doesn't even contain a name, we're going to let them know to please make sure to add a name before saving. So that's what if F5 is empty, we're going to get a message box. If B4, now what I wanted to do is when we're saving, we're going to, whether it's saving an item or whether we're adding a new we're updating existing item, this one here, this button here, it is the same macro. This same macro is going to use for update and save. So what I need to do is I need to differentiate. Is it a new item or is it an existing item? If it's a new item, we click new, we know that item row is going to be blank. If it's an existing item, we know that item row is going to contain a value, item B4. So if B4 is blank, we know it's a brand new item. If it contains a value, it's an existing. So that's just what we've done here. If B4 equals empty, it's a new item. Else, we would go down here, it's an existing. Else, existing item right here. For new items, we just want to do three things. The first thing we need to do is determine the item row. It's going to be the first available row using end x left plus one. And also what I want to do is I want to set that item row. Remember, it's coming from B5. That is our one using the max pharma. We're going to place that in B3. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set that first item ID as the first available in row A in the item row. So all we're going to be doing, that's only for new items, is setting that. So in this case, this would be 22 if we're creating a new item, 22 right here. Otherwise, if it's an existing item, all we need to do is pull the item row directly from B4. Next up, we're going to use data mapping. We're going to run a loop from 2 to 15. Again, we're going to do run a loop. We've already done column 1, so we don't need it. So column 2, all the way to column 15 here. What we're going to do is we're going to look inside F5 here, and we're going to place it directly in column 2 here. Here. We're going to look in H5 and place it here and so on and so forth. So that's just what we do right here. The item database, the item row, and the item column is going to be equal to whatever is located in row 1 item column value. So this is our range right here. 
and it's going to be placed basically as the save data to database. Now what we need to do is unique for assembly items. When we save an update, I need to know, is it an assembly item? I need to check because if it's an assembly item, what do I need to do? I need to make sure that we've saved any items that are in the assembly. So for example, in this computer set, I need to do is look to see, are there any um, assembly items that need to be saved? And as you remember, those assembly items are saved right here. So are we saving anything? So what I want to do is I want to say, is it an assembly item? If it is an assembly item, then I want to check what's the last row. If the last row is less than 36, that means, yes, it is an assembly item, but the user hasn't added any rows, hasn't added any items, so we don't need to save it. But assuming that there are items, in this case, the last row will be 45, I want to loop through all the way from 36 to 45. I want to look, has this item already been added to this assembly? How would we know if it's been added already? Well, we can see here inside our assembly database row here. This one's been added, this one's been added. But notice if we add another one, let's say in 46, if we add another one, this, I don't know why we would add a bathroom vanity cabinet to a computer, but you get the point. So this, notice this one, it would have to be saved new, right? Because it doesn't have it. So we'd have to look in column R saying, does a row exist if not added? You know, if not, there's no, then we need to add it to the database. And that's just what we do inside the code. The first thing we do is determine making sure that it is an assembly. The last one, we're going to get that last assembly row. Remember, I need to know that last row from E59 on up. What does that mean there? Starting with E59 all the way up, not below that, right? All the way up, I want to know the last row. In this case, it's 45. So if the last row is less than 36, then go to no items. Skipping down here, going to no items, right? That means there's no, nothing we can do. There's no items. Assuming that there are items, again, I want to run that check. Has it been added before? If column R of the range and the assembly row, remember, we're going to loop through those rows for assembly row 36 to the last assembly row. I'm running that loop, starting in 36, going to the last row. I'm looking in R. Does R contain a value? If it does, then it's been added again, then make the update. If R equals empty, then it's a new item. I need to do a few things. First thing what I want to do is I want to determine what's the first available row inside our assembly database. We're going to use A and X. Oh, that's a lot of nines there. But um, we're going to add plus one as the first available row. Next thing what I want to do is I want to add that item ID. That item ID is going to come directly from B3. I need to know that item ID. In, in inside B3 right here, and I need to place it directly inside our first column here. I want to put that. I want to know what is the item ID. Next up, I want to place the name there, and I want to place, but, but basically for new items, I only want to do this, item row and the row. So that's what we're going to do right here. So inside D and inside E, we're going to place that item row. That's the assembly row, right? We just pulled the assembly row. What is the assembly row? That is this row right here. I want to know row 36, row 37, row 30, and I want to place it directly inside here. I want to know it inside column D, row 36, 37, and then I want to place the row of the database, 14, 15, whatever that row is in column E. So those are only for new items. D takes on the assembly row. E takes on the assembly database row with a formula equals row. Okay, next up, what I want to do is I, now that we've saved it, I want to put R now inside R. We have saved it to a database. We do have a row that we can associate with the database, and I want to place that directly inside R. Else, if it's an existing, there's just one thing to do is then extract that row from whatever's in R. So we have the assembly database row, whether it is an existing one or whether it is a new one. Now we have it. So now what we need to do is just update two components, the item name and the quantity. So everything else is there. All I need to do is shape the item name and the quantity, and that's going to come directly from here. The item name is going to come from E. The quantity is going to come from G. So we're going to update that directly inside the database. So we do that with the two lines of code here. B takes on, of course, our item name. C takes on our item quantity. It's going to come from E and G. That's it. That's all we have to do. Next up, I want to make sure that now that we have now saved it, I want to make sure that it is our new item group, that button set that we saved it, this button set, and we click Add New, I want to make sure this button set is hidden, right? And the existing button set here is now displayed right here, existing. So we're just going to do that through the two lines of code. Again, we're going to uh, hide the new item group, and then we're going to show the existing, show existing item group. So we've got that there. So that's basically how we save or update existing items. What, how do we load it? Well, loading is relatively simple. It's just in reverse. The first thing what we want to do is we want to clear all the data 
clearing all that data very very important so we clear all the data again i want to make sure that b4 b4 is our database row so when i select let's click in here so we can load up and go back into a load another vanity let's take a look at this one when i load an assembly here okay full computer set so we've got assembly item here now what i want to do is once we have a row i want to make sure that b4 contains a value remember for in the add new screen b4 is blank so we want to make sure that it does contain a value b4 has to we have to have a row if we're going to load anything up so to do that we need to make sure that b4 if it's empty please select the correct item from the item on the left okay now the first thing what i want to do again remember we may have some items here if we're if we're clicking and loading it we may have if we selected an assembly item we may have some here some pictures here down below so i want to make sure that as soon as we load something something different right i want to make sure that all those pictures get deleted so to do that we want to make sure that we do that so we can do that with these lines of code again for each item shapes if it equals assembly picture we went over this is the exact we're just going to delete everything that contains the item picture okay again i want to show i want to make sure that we're hiding the expand and hiding the shrink button by default we're just going to hide those anytime we load any item we're hiding them. and then of course we're going to show them but only based on the assembly item the item picture folder we're going to put that into variable just like we did up there the item row is going to be set into b4 we're going to then load the item data this is basically an exact reverse of what we did when we saved it in this case right we're taking the item the updating the item database based on whatever's in those ranges in this case we're updating the ranges based on whatever's in the item database so that's all we have to do just running that loop and just simply running and all we're going to be doing is just simply whatever's located in that row and looping through all these bringing all that information filling out our form here okay so now that we have that we can continue on inside our code if b1 i need to determine what tab has been selected if b1 equals four then to show the picture right i want to make sure that we're going to run the macro to show the item picture but i only want to run that macro if it is currently b4 if we've currently selected general info if they load something in here i, I don't want to show that picture except unless we select that i want to make sure that we're actually selecting that so we do that a little bit later on so we want to make sure that we're showing it but only if the general info tab is selected but uh, also what i want to do is i want to know if h5 it's in an assembly group we're going to do some do some things but we're only doing it if it is an assembly these are the things that we're only doing for assembly first thing what we want to do is i want to load all those items in right if it's an assembly we need to make sure that we load those items in how are we going to do that well what i'm going to do is simply going to run an advanced filter and that advanced filter is going to be based on the item id so again inside the assembly what i want to do is i want to run a criteria an advanced filter based on all these items based on a simple id now this id is equal to b3 our criteria is set so whatever's in b3 is going to be set then what i want to do is extract only those items for our item id which is these here and i want to bring these into here then i want to take this data and i want to bring it directly inside here inside our assembly items bringing it all in here so we do that with the following lines of code so the last assembly row is going to be to run our assembly database if the last is less than three that means that we have no items in the assembly database so there's no reason to move on so those are going to go to no items assuming that we do what we want to do is i want to show that expand button right we know we are on assembly we know we've got to show that button this is the expand button this one right here is called expand button i want to show that the macro that's tied to this button is going to allow the user to display those items as part of that assembly so we can show that in the assembly then we're going to run our advanced filter the assembly database based on a2 through e that is this right here a2 all the way through e making sure they have we're having our criteria from g2 through g3 and we want those results to appear from i2 through l2 so that's just what we do here inside our advanced filter our criteria here is a g2 through g3 having that item uh, id and our results are going to come from i to l2 then what i want to do is i want to determine the last row of our results in this case the last row is 12. i want to put that into a variable if that last row is less than three of course we cannot move on so i want to put that all into a variable here so the last results row is less than three exit the sub we're putting that last results row based on whatever's in column i9 okay then what we're going to do is assuming that we have data right there's more than three we're going to run a loop from three to last row and all i'm going to do is determine the item row based on k this is why that item row that is so important k here 
36, 37 is directly related. We know exactly what row to replace it in. 36, 37, 38. We gotta pull that row to extract it inside our assembly here. Okay, so we need to extract. And then I also want to do is take the name, take the quantity, and put the row. I don't put all this information, and I want to put directly inside here. So not only there, but I also want to put the database row inside column R, and I want to put that information here. So we can do that with just the following lines of code. The item row we know is going to extract from E. So E is going to take on our item name. G is going to take on our quantity required, and R we're going to update with that database row. So just those three lines of code is all we have to do. That's all we need to do. And then of course we're going to we we know it's an existing item, so we're going to make sure that we're hiding that new item group, and we're going to make sure to show the existing item group. Cancel a new is very simple. Remember, all we need to do is we're going to run a change event. Right? That change event is going to load up. So we've just went over how to load it, but how do we know to trigger that? Well, we trigger that when there's a change to I3. When there's a change to I3, we run the macro load. Right. So all we need to do is just click here, and it's going to run that macro. So changing that I3 done that. And that's, of course, a change event where we actually run this item load here. So when we go into the items, and we look on the top, and we see here's our change event. Now we're focused on a single change i3 if the user makes a change to i3 and we want to make sure that i3 is empty is not empty if it's not then what we're going to do is we're going to set d3 here's range so we're going to select that we're going to, we want to make sure we select the general info tab right when i select if i'm here and i want to load an item here let's go back into here all right if we're in the assembly right and i select another item i want to make sure that the general info gets selected automatically notice how that happened so the first thing what we want to do is select d3 that's going to set the general info tab the next thing what i want to do is i want to put that id whatever's in b2 how do we get that id from b2 what's in b2 it is the item name id so when we put an item name in here if we pause the code that item name is going to come up it happens so quick because i clear this out but you'll see basically let's pause it so you can see exactly how that happens before i do that and so when i check here right we see now let's pause it right we see now that the item name id is based on this so we have the id we're going to extract that id number I want to extract that ID number using a formula. We're going to index that item ID. We're going to run a match based on an item name, a named range based on the item names, based on I3. We want an exact match, and I want a column. So what I want to do is I want to extract what is the item ID of this 50-inch band D, right? I want to know the item ID. So when I look in the item, I know that the item ID is 1. We've extracted that, and I put it directly inside B2. Once I have that value, if I take that value, what's in B2, and I place it directly inside B3, that's going to generate this row. So that's all I do inside the code. So if we continue on the code, B3 is going to take on the item ID. So I can put an item ID. Okay, so it's going to take it on. So if we continue that, and then we run the macro the load, the, that loads that. So that's it. That's all we have to do. And that macro also clears out whatever's in here. Clear this out. This is automatically cleared out based on the if error. Okay, so we see how to load it. So the cancel new, which we're going to go over next, is simply similar. All we're going to be doing is just loading in the first available, just anything. So when I'm in the add new and I want to cancel this, I want to load in the first available. Where's that first available? It's located directly here inside B4. So it's the first available. That's just going to load in some other assuming that it's value. So we just need to run a check inside that cancel new, which is right up here. Item macros here. And then um, so the cancel new is here. If item database B4 does not equal empty, then I3, items I3, equals whatever's here. That's going to load set first item name to load. So that's going to do. So it loads it up automatically in place that item name. Okay, great. Last thing is delete. Relatively simple. All we need to do is make sure that does the user want to delete, yes or no. Then if they don't, you know, they say no, then exit this up. Assuming that they do, we want to make sure that B4 contains a row. If it doesn't, let the user know to select the correct row. If it does, we're going to put it into a variable. And then what we're going to do is the item database, item row, and the colon item and delete that going to run the add new macro and let the user know that it's been deleted. That's it. Okay, great. That's it for the item macros. Now what about the assembly macros? There's just basically a few macros to go over in this. Not too many, but this is where it gets really, really interesting. So let's go over this. We've got an assembly. Let's go ahead and load up one of our assemblies. We'll take on the computer assembly here. And I want to load it up. So basically what I want to do here is I want to know a few things. If I'm going to build the computers, I want to know how many we can build. 
So I want to click assemble, which is going to build them. I have a maximum that, of course, the, right now the total, I have total assembled, and I've got available five to build. We went over that briefly. Why do I have only five to build? Well, because I need to know what is the maximum number I can build. If, I'm, if I've got a total of 10 DDR RAMs in stock, and each computer uses two, I know that I've got a maximum of five to build. But how do I know that? How do I know that this is five? Well, we can use a little bit of a helper column to do that. So let's take a look inside over here. Inside column T, we have something called available to build. Right? So available to build, I need to know how many available to build. First of all, I don't want this to be used for service type items. So I need to know also what the item type is. So we're gonna run an index here. Let's just call this item type here. And I want to make sure that the item type is not a service. I'm only gonna only use this for item. If the item type is a service, as it would be in, let's just load up another item here. We have uh, our bathroom, this one um, included, bathroom vanity set included some uh, labor. So let's put that, let's use that as an example. So notice we've got a service item here. So I wanna make sure that if it's a service item, we don't include it. So what I wanna know is how many available to build. So we see that it's empty here. So for example here, let's take a look inside here. We have two assembled, we don't have any available to build. Well, let's go back to the other part because we've got some available to build here. The full computer set like that. Okay, back inside here, I want to, because I want to emphasize right this one right here. So we know that if if we have 10 total parts of DDRM in stock and we need 2%, we know that we have. So all we need to do is to use a divide, the quantity in stock, divided by the, the number required, we know that we've got a limit of five, right? So we know that five. However, this one we're going to use, we've got power supply, we've got 10 in stock and we only need one. So this one we can build 10. But what we wanna know is the lowest number. What is the lowest number? Do you understand that? It's very important that we understand because the lowest number is gonna be the maximum number that we can build. So we're gonna put all that inside a column here. So for example, here, if there's an error, if U36 is service, then just show empty because it's not gonna be benefit for service items, right? There's no, we don't need to stock service items. There's no inventory on service type items, it's labor. So basically it's J36 divided by G36, again, J36 divided by G36. So we know that we've got 10, we can build 10 computers based on that. However, if we're building it, right, we know we've got, we want the limit. So we're just gonna run this down all the way. For example, this one, seven here, let's take a look at that. We only have seven in stock and we've got a black monitor, right? So we only have seven stocks. So we've got a limit of seven. So we can't build 10 computers because we only have seven monitors, right? So we, so the, right now, seven's the maximum. But what about here? Look at this. This, of course, this item here is our RAM, right? We have 10 in stock, but we need two per computer. So again, the maximum that we could build would be five, right? So the maximum that we can build is basically the lowest number. So all we need to do is run a formula. We need to look for the lowest number. In this case, the lowest number is five. Five is the maximum number of computers that we can build because we only have a limited number of RAM. Now, if we were to increase the number of RAM that we had, we could build more, right? Or if we were to decrease the number, right? If we were, if we only use one per computer, right? Then that would decrease, and then we can increase it. Then you see this would go to ten. We could build ten of those because we only need one per computer. So that based on the number used per assembly. So we can have it. So what I want to do is I need a formula. I need to look all the way here, and I want to know the minimum number of value. That minimum is five. If I know the minimum is five, that happens to be the maximum number of computers that we can build. So the available to build here is simply the minimum of T36 through T58. That's where we get our problem. Now, if I want to assemble, again, we have available to be able to say, if I want to assemble six, we got a problem here, right? Because we can't assemble six. So we're going to use some conditional formatting. If we go into conditional formatting, it's a relatively simple rule. All we need to do is make sure that if M39 is greater, let's edit that rule, M39 is greater than M38, color this red. That's going to give the user this visual indication that there's a problem. Right? But if you want to assemble four, it's no problem. So that's what we're going to do. So first thing we want to do is just make sure that the 
item to assemble is either less than or equal to ones that are available to build. And we know the available to build because we've got all the items here. So that column is going to help us there. It's called the assembly build. That's the Mac we're going to go into. And we're going to walk you through the rest of it right now. So the first thing what I want to do is, of course, we need to make sure that M39, if it is greater than M38, again, it's too many. The user has selected too many to build. This is another check, right? We want to make sure they can't build, right, six if there's only five built. So if M39 is greater than M38, then let them know. And that's just what we do in the first line of code. If M39 is greater, please make sure the items set to build quantity is less than or equal to whatever that number is in M38. Exit the sub, make sure that the user actually lowers the number. Okay, what I want to do is I want to get that assembly database row that's located in B4. This time it's the assembly database row. I want to know what the database is for that, right, located. I want to know inside here, B4 is going to tell us that row. I want to update that inside. If we click on the general, we'll see it's in B4. So I want to know that, putting that into a variable. I want to know the build quantity located in M39, the quantity that we will need to build. The last item row based on E15, we're going to have to loop through all these items. I want to know the last item row. In this case, it's 45. So we're going to put that into a variable. If for some reason the last item was less than 37, there are no items. So we need to make sure that you have at least two items, right? I want to make sure the two items. 36, if one item is not really an assembly, right? Assembly is two or more items. So we want to make sure that the last row is at least 37 or above that. So we do that here. If the last row is less than 37, please make sure you have at least two items to build your assembly. Now we're going to run a loop from the first row, 36, to the last item row. The first thing I want to pull and extract that item database row, getting it here. This is the item database located in S. That's the item database row. This is the item database. Because if I'm going to be updating those quantities, updating those quantities on hand or quantity in stock, I need to know what row that item is located. It is located in column S. So when we click here and we go all the way over and we take a look at column S, we see that this is the item database row. We're going to use, uh, to get that extract, we're going to use the match formula. We're going to base it on what's in E36. That is the item name. And we're going to run the match against that named range. And of course, we want three because we want the exact row that it's located on. I want that row. That's the item database. So this is located on row 14 or row 15. I want that row here. So what we want to do is extract that and put that inside a variable. And that's going to be called the item database row. I also want to know the quantity required. It's going to be located in column G. Extracting that into a variable here. We know we're going to require here, in this case, column G. How many are required to build it because I want to build if I know that I'm going to need two DDR RAMs and I know that we're going to build four then I need to deduct eight right we currently have ten but I know that I need to deduct eight from the current inventory two times four is eight and then minus ten is going to be two so that's going to leave us with two right there okay so we need to get that inside the quantity required inside a variable if you and the item rows does not equal service, right? I want to make sure that we're not changing the service. I want to make sure that it's not service. Then, assuming me, right, we're looking for, remember, the service type, you, call you. We want to make sure it's not a service item. As long as it's not, then we can deduct the quantity. So we can do that here. Then the item database, M, M is where our located. If we go into the item database and we go in column M, we see that that is our quantity. It is that that we're going to deduct. Whatever the current value is, we're going to subtract basically the item number of items times the assemble quantity. So in this case, right, 2 times 4 is 8. We're going to subtract whatever's there minus 8. So that's just what we do in this line of code. M is equal to whatever's currently there located here minus here the quantity required times the built quantity. We're going to subtract whatever directly from the inventory. And that's all we do there, okay? And then also what I want to do is I want to increase the build, right? If we're increasing, if I'm, cre if I'm adding four of these, right, I want to make sure that, let's say, our current quantity on hand of this particular item, full computer set is 10. If I'm building four, I want to make sure that we're increasing it by four, increasing this quantity, quantity on hand. So inside this right here, our full computer set, our quantity on hand here is 10. So if I build it, I want to make sure that this goes up to 14, right? So if I click that, then we can do that right here. M and the assembly database row, we've already defined that here, equals whatever is currently there 
plus the build quantity. We're increasing this. Then, of course, we're going to clear M39. We've already done that, so we just want to clear. We've already built it now, so we can clear out whatever's located in M39, clearing that build quantity out. And then also what I want to do is I want to update this quantity, right? If I've now if we have 10 before and now we have 14, I want to make sure that we're updating J11 with that new quantity. So J11 is equal to whatever's in M37. So that is the new quantity, right? M37 also takes on our new quantity because why is that? This got updated. Remember, this got updated to 14. I'm going to walk you through this in a second. So once it gets updated here, so does this. So does this because this here, total assembled, is equal to we're simply indexing the item in stock this is a named range called item in stock i want to run a match so we're going to basically let's go over that formula name manager let's escape out of there name manager here items in stock is simply just the named range for that single column there item quantity in stock right here so i'm just going to basically extract that 10 based on a match based on whatever's in b3 in the item id so this is going to update automatically 14. i want to take this 14 and i want to go place it directly in here so that is all we're going to do so when i click assemble items it's going to do just that it's going to update this to 14. it's going to change this to 14 and it's going to change all those stock right all those stocks got reduced in ddr and now we only have one to build why do we only have one to build because we just built it right we only have two more ddrs left so we can only build one more computer and so that's it the message box right f5 have been built right we just need to go how many a message box whatever's in f5 assemblies have been built so we just need a message box that is it that's all we need to do to assemble but what if we want to disassemble it we can also disassemble we've now assembled 14 but what if i want to take and disassemble i can put it in here again we cannot disassemble more than the quantity we have we've got a conditional formatting same rule that conditional formatting is of course if m40 is greater than what is located inside m37 then show it red and if i try to disassemble it's going to be please make sure that the set the disassemble is less than or equal to 14 right we can't disassemble more than we have but if i want to disassemble let's say two of them i can do that without a problem so how do we do that well it's simply just the same but it's simply a reverse first thing we want to do is again check to make sure that we are not disassembling more than the have been created so if m40 is greater than m37 then please make sure just as what you that message box you just saw to set the disassembles less than or equal to m37 so we want to make sure that we can't disassemble more than our exam so then what we want to do is that same thing we're going to pull that assembly row again the disassemble Quantity. We'll call this the disassemble quality is based on M40. We need to track this one. I want to know M40, how many are we disassembling? So that's going to be the disassemble quantity or disk quantity. The last item row, again, we're going to make sure that we're running a loop. Please make sure that you have at least two items. For running that loop, again, starting in 36, the item database row located in S, we need to update that item data. This time we're going to increase the item database, right? If we're disassembling, if I'm disassembling two, I'm going to, this case, I'm going to increase this by eight, right? Two, in this case, right? We know that we're doing two computers. If the current quantity is two, it's going to, the update's going to be four, right? So it's going to be six if we add the quantity in stock. If I disassemble two computers, right, I'm going to take those uh, two RAMs from each computer. I'm going to increase it, our quantities by four. So it's going to be six if I do that for six. Okay, so we could do that. So the quantity required is going to be based on G. We same thing as we did before. This time, again, making sure that it's not a service item. Whatever the current quantity on hand inside M is, inside M, whatever the current quantity on hand is, in this case, right, two or whatever it is, here is our RAM is two. I want to increase that quantity. So M this time, we're simply going to equals, this case is going to be M, right, whatever the current value is in this case, plus the quantity times this quantity. And that's going to increase the total build. And this case, so we're going to do that for every single item. And also what we want to do in this case, we're deducting, we're subtracting from our assembly, right? If we're, if we're disassembling a specific assembly, we are going to deduct, right? So if we take a look inside the item database, and I've got 14 computers and I disassemble two, I want to make sure that this goes to 12. So we need to deduct whatever's there. So in this case, M and Debo equals M minus the disassembled quantity, subtracting that. Again, clearing this case 
M40. Again, we're going to update the quantity on hand inside J11, and we're going to set a distance. So again, if I run this code right here, and I disassemble two right here, we're going to say two full computer sets have been disassembled. Okay, clicking OK. We see that our RAM now updated to six. We take a look at our item database. It's now to 12, right? We've in increased to 12. We look in here in the general info. We see it's now 12. Our quantity on hand is now updated. We've now disassembled that. Great. Cool. Now the last two macros that I want to show you, the last macro really essentially, is simply this, the expanded. So in this case, what do I want to do? I want to basically show the components of this assembly. I want to take the pictures and I want to display them out. And I want to display them at least however many rows that come up and generally display them. We can increase this and increase this. So that's all I want to do. Now we know the assembly item, so all we need to do is loop through these items, find the picture, right? We know the picture is located in the item database. We know that item database row is located here. So we've got the item database row. I know, if I know the row and I know that the picture is going to be located inside column L, then all we need is test that it's a picture. I want to have a starting left position. I want to have a starting top position here. And I want, then I want to move to the right. And then I get to a certain point, let's say beyond, if it any, goes anywhere beyond L, I want to drop the row and have continue on. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, this is relatively simple macro. We're going to go over it right now. First thing we need to do is we're going to need to have a connector, a sample connector. Notice we're using connectors here. And I've just connected them basically so that it provides a nice even connection so that we can see them that the loop. And then I want to, you know, have the plus and show it up. So we need a sample connector. That's going to be called connector sample. I also want a text box because I want to show not only the name, but I want to show how many components were in here. One fan, this and this, two gigabytes of RAM. I want to show all that in here. So how do we do that? Well, we can use the sample text box that we've set up. So actually, we could change the text in this to make it a little more simple. It's called a sample text. Sample text because the, the, it doesn't matter because it gets changed. Okay. So now that we have that, we've got a sample text box. So the first thing what we want to do is make sure that we've given them a specific name as we went over before called assembly pick and making sure that our samples don't include that, don't include that because when we delete everything, we don't want to delete our samples. It is our samples that we're going to be duplicating to create this. So we're going to do that. So assembly expand. This is the macro that's tied to this button right here, this plus button. If we click assign macro, we see it as this macro assembly expand so when we go into this macro first thing what we want to do is when we expand it we want to make sure that we've deleted every just in case there's anything there i want to sh delete everything else so again we're going to run that same loop that we run before making sure that if anything with assembly picture are going to delete it next thing what i want to do is i want to put the picture folder inside a variable just as we did before and i want to set the last item row this time we're using a different way to the last item row and why is that because it's often going to be hidden if it's hidden right I want to make sure it's going to be a little bit difficult. Notice those columns are hidden. It's more difficult for Excel to find the last row, in this case 45, if those rows are hidden or columns are hidden. So we're going to use, I'm going to use count A. In this case, I'm going to use count A all the way from count A, the same thing we would use if we were using inside a formula, count A all the way from E36 all the way to E58. So we're going to use the count A function. So we can use application worksheet function count A range E36 to E58, okay? And then I should probably just put in the items here. I like to put that in here just in case. Better. Okay, so E36 to E58. And then I want to add 35. Why am I adding 35? Because I, if I count three items, I want to make sure we're starting off on row 36. So adding that will make sure that we can start over because I want the last row. If I know the last row is 45 and we count a total of 10, I want to make sure that we're adding it. Okay, so we want to make sure counting in this case 11. I want to make sure that we add that particular row 35 so we can get to 46, right? So I'm going to make sure 45, excuse me, last row being 45. There we go. So we count 10. We've got 35. That's going to get us 45. If the last row is less than 37, then exit the sub, right? If there's no items, then we cannot continue. The first thing I want to do is I want to set some initial start and left position. So we're going to have a starting position of left start. In fact, I'm going to put the left position, that same left position, into two variables. Left start, this one will always, this will never change. This is going to help us. Left position, this will update accordingly. The left position could, so I want two different left positions, right? I want the starting position, which will never change because it's going to help us 
place these all the way on the left. But the left position will change from here to here to here. As we grow the left position, one of those is going to grow. One of those is going to always stay the same. That's why I'm putting it into two different variables here. The top position is going to be based on E17, the top position. That's right here. This cell right here is our top, is our top left position and our top top position. Okay, so we've got both of those on the left position. The picture, well, we're gonna, I want to know what row we're on, right? As we add rows, row one, row two, I want to keep track of what row we're on. So we're going to start that off at one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to get ready to run our loop. For the item row equals 36 to the last item row. And we're going to set that item database. Remember that item database is very important so we can extract that picture name. So S, column S contains that and it's going to be the item database row. Our picture file, again, is going to be located the picture folder we've already defined a new variable, that backslash, the item database, and remember N contains that picture folder, picture name, column N contains it. If I know the row and I know the column, then I know I can extract that name. I need that name because it is that name that we're going to be able to build that full file path using that. So once we have that, is that picture file path, that entire path. Once we have that, we need to check to make sure it is accurate. We're using the directory function, the picture file, VB directory. If it's empty, then go to the next item. We're going to skip all the way down here and go to the next item. Nothing else we can do if for some reason we have an inaccurate path. Assuming that the path is correct, then we can do, we can do a few things. Okay, so the first thing what we want to do is I want to create that picture pictures we're going to insert that picture based on that picture path and we're going to give it a specific name that assembly picture and the item row this just gives it a unique name and it's easier to work when we have a unique name that item row we're going to be looping so we know for every single picture we've got a unique name assembly picture and row now we can work with that the first thing i want to do is i'm going to place that left position based on the left that first one that top position and i want to lock that aspect ratio true and i want to set a specific width of 60 right remember i'm locking Locking that aspect ratio first before I'm setting the width, that's going to make sure that the picture doesn't get contorted. I will make sure that aspect ratio remains correct. Okay, so that places the picture and sizes the picture exactly where we want it. Right? So we're done with the picture, but I want to do a few other things. I want to put a connector here. I want to put that connector, create this connector. I want to take this connector, connection. I want to duplicate it. And then what I want to do is I want to set it based on a specific position. Based on what? I want to connect the top portion of that connector to the shrink button. I want to place the bottom two against that picture in a specific position. Now these connectors have position. This is position one, this is position two, this is position three, I believe. On the picture here, again, same thing. This is position one, two, three, four, I believe. So I want to place it directly on position three, that top position, and then on position one in there. So we can do just that with that connector. The first thing we're going to do is duplicate our sample connector here. And then we're going to say a sample picture. We're giving it a specific name using that item row, but this name is called, again, using that unique text that we can easily remove it, assemble picture, but this time we're adding on CON connector. So giving a name. Now with that specific connector, we're going to set a specific format. If the picture row equals one, now I want to kind of set a little bit different. Notice I've got a connector here. If the row is two, right, when I do row, I don't want to set this all the way up here. It looks kind of funky, right? So I don't want it. The second row, I just want to do it to here. Only the first row do I want to set here. So notice there's a differentiation between the rows. If the picture row equals one, the top row, begin connect, shape, shrink button, that position three, position three, remember that this is our where we're connecting it to shrink button connecting it to position three one two three connecting it to that position three so that's the first that's where we're going to begin it right and what do we else otherwise remember it's not row let's see the top let's put this top row top row and this is Oh, let's see, all other rows, all other rows. In other rows, I want to connect it to something else. I want to, that begin connect, I want to see the assembly text picture. We're going to do that in a second, which is this text picture right here. I want to set it to this picture. If I know, right, that this is connector 44, right, and I know that this is 36, right, that's an 8 difference, right? So I want to subtract 8 
from that, right? So how do we do that? We know because we're simply adding here. We're adding nine here, right? Nine, so we're subtracting. Then we're nine pictures. Then we know the difference is eight. So the difference is eight. So the item row is minus eight. Item row, basically what I want to do is begin the connection. This, when we get to the second row, begin this connection on whatever the text box is above here. So probably make that text box a little bit bigger. Too. Okay, so that's all we do. Otherwise, the end connector stays the same no matter what. The end connector is simply the first position of the, the end connector. This is the end connection right here. This is the end. It's going to be that position one of that picture. Position two, position three, position four. We want position one. So it's position one here of the assembly picture. So that's all we need to do to run that connector. Now what we need to do is create that text box. That text box here, we're going to simply duplicate this text box here. I could probably make it a little bit bigger here, third row. But basically, if we change this, it'll change. So if I add a little bit bigger, it'll be bigger. But we just kept it the same. Then what we want to do is create a text box. So duplicate this ex existing text box. And what do I want to put inside the text box? I want to take whatever is the name located in E. I want to take the quantity whatever is located in G. I want to combine those to create that text box. And I want to put that number first. Then I want to put a dash. In fact, for example, I want to put a number. Then I want to put a dash. Then I want to put the name in there. So that's just what we do in here. So the first thing is I put that assembly text inside a string. It's going to be G, right, which is our number, our quantity, right, inside G quantity, plus the name, which is located in E, and I want to put a dash in between them. That's going to create that text. Once I have that text inside a string, I can do shapes, text box, duplicate our sample right here. Give it a specific name. Again, assembly picture, but this time we're adding text on that, giving that a unique name using the row. Once I know that we can work with that, the left position is going to be the left position, the top position is going to be the top position, plus 62, right? I want to put that a little bit lower, right? I want to put it lower. That's 62. This one's a little bit big of a picture, but it's fine. It's sufficient, right? So placing it directly below. So that's going to paste at the top. If it's going to have the same top position, it'll be the same. We don't want the same. I want to paste it below that. So about 62 pixels below that. And then I want to assign some text to that text frame. Text frame two, text range, text equals that assembly text. Add the quantity and item name. So that's how we, that's all we need to do with both of those. And that's it. That's all we have to do. And I want to update that. So once we loop, once we place our first one, I want to update the left position. So I want that left position to be incremented and keep moving to the left, keep moving to the left all the way until we get to a certain point. Well, what certain point is? Well, we're going to be based on the left position of column L. If I go beyond the left position of column L, I want to jump down one row. And I want to keep doing that for however many items that we have. So we need to run a check. If the left position is greater than L, the left position of column L, the row doesn't matter, then what we want to do is increase the top position. The top position is going to be equal to whatever the current top position is plus 105. The left position, again, this is where this left start. Set back, let's put it set back to initial left position position. That's why we have it in two variables, because this left start never changes. So this left position reverts back to the original left position. And the picture row increases. We need to know the picture row differentiation, because here or here, the connectors change based on that. So we always want to update the picture row. Otherwise, right, it's not a new row, then all we need to do is simply update the left position, left position plus 90, right? If you wanted them closer together, you would just change it. Sure. So if we change it, let's say if we made that 80 or something, it'd be a little bit closer together. So all we would have to do is just reduce this and then increase this. And you see now they're a little bit, now we see we, see we have a little bit different there. And we've got a left position, but I like the way we have it there because it's a little bit different, but we can add more in here. I think this is probably should be, so this one we should probably change. So now we notice it, now it is nine. Now that number is nine. So we can probably make that as a variable. Notice the variable, the eight or nine variable based on how many pictures we could keep account, right? If we've got 10 here, one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine there, we want to subtract nine, right? So we notice that. So we can make that variable based on that. But I will work it out. 90 seemed to be sufficient based on that. So that's all we have to do. Now the rest is the shrink button. The shrink is very, very simple, just a few lines of code. For the shrink button, of course, that's the macro that's tied to this, this button right here. When we shrink it, all we need to do is hide that, delete all those shapes, and simply just do that. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, that's relatively simple. All we need to do is for each name and shape, the assembly picture, if it's greater than zero, then delete it just as we did before. I want to hide that shrink button and I want to show the expand button. So that's just what we do inside here. We shrink it or hide it just based on this. Very, very simply. So those are the two macros that are assigned to that. All right, wow, this has been a very cool training. In this training, I showed you not only how you can create new items, but create assembly items, and also I'll show you how to combine those and assemble those into quantity and disassemble those, along with exactly how you can display those in a nice little grid so we can know exactly what is made up in our assembly. And that is all part of an incredible bill of materials training. If you do like these trainings and you wanna pick up 200 of my best workbooks, you can do it for just seven $77. I'm going to include the links down below. Also, if you do want to go beyond this training and see more updated and get your ideas into these applications, I'm doing all that inside Patreon. This week, we're going to be adding in an invoice and a purchase order. So make sure you sign up there. Tons more things going on inside of Patreon. You want to become a member, just a few dollars a month. All right. Thanks so much. We will see you next week. It's been an incredible training. Thank you again for, don't forget to comment, subscribe, click that like button, and we'll see you next week.